So as I think about the conversations we've had over the past few days, um, another thought springs to mind, which is I think in this time in our nation's history with some of the challenges that we're grappling with, uh, I think the rise of women leading major newsrooms is a hopeful sign. I, can, can we not say that based on Deborah's uh, presentation on Sunday evening and the impact that she and Susan Goldberg's presence at National <coughs> Geographic had? And then as we look across the country, uh, there are women leading the Miami Herald, the Charlotte Observer, the Dallas Morning News, the, the Houston Chronicle, the, Houston Chronicle. <laughs> the Savannah Morning News, paper, Box Media. Box Media. All over the country, we're, we're starting to see this, uh, this trend. We hope it's more than a trend. We hope it will become uh, commonplace. But as I also think of our next speaker, Catalina Camilla, I also think of her role in helping to uh, establish the presence and the, the um, importance of the Asian American experience in, in newsrooms. Uh, her, you read her bio, you know her, her extensive experience. But as we talked about what she might discuss today, um, I think the, the sort of code switching and the things that women in leadership have to do to not only make a stand, take, stand their ground and, and, and make a mark, it, there's an important lesson for everyone to learn. And I can think of no better person to talk about these issues than Catalina Camilla. So please, take the floor. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, I was telling Rachel, nice job, NPF fellows, on improving the weather here in Washington. Uh, uh, I am glad to be here. Uh, this is one of my first in-person events in a while, and I am glad that I am here to uh, hopefully, uh, you know, help you all and pull you over the wall. It's a, con it's a phrase that I learned early on uh, working with uh, the Freedom Forum and their Chips Quinn Scholars Program, which places interns of color in newsrooms across the country. And John C. Quinn, one of the uh, founding editors of USA Today who founded the Chips Quinn Scholars Program, had this saying that it was all of our responsibility to help the next person up over the wall. And uh, I may not remember all your names, but when I see you or uh, encounter you in the future, please remind me that we met here. Uh, and let me uh, set the stage for a couple of things that I'm gonna talk about today. One, I want you all at the end of my presentation, just like with the other presentations uh, that you've uh, heard, is to walk away with the feeling that you're not alone, okay? You have allies and friends in this room, you've made allies and friends amongst your speakers, and then you're gonna be in a position, no matter what your title is, where you work, of being leaders and also bringing along the next person, okay? Uh, I hope that after uh, my talk, you get inspired about thinking about coming back to Washington or specializing in a career as a public affairs journalist, because uh, that's what I do. I specialize in uh, government and uh, political reporting. But I also want you, hopefully, to walk away knowing that the power and the courage that you need to be successful journalists today is right in here, okay? Um, I'm gonna start though with the quiz. We are in the shadow of the White House and you're not too far away from the US Capitol. Does anybody know who Alice Dunnigan is?
journalist? Yes, that's right. That's right. Miss Alice Dunnigan was the first black female to have credentials to cover the White House, to cover the Congress, and to cover the Supreme Court. I stand here, and you, you, men and women, are here because of Alice Dunnigan. Alice Dunnigan was born in 1906 in rural Kentucky to a sharecropper and a domestic worker. And she spent her entire life fighting against racism, sexism, and poverty. In 1947, she became the first black female to hold credentials to cover the White House. And she worked for an organization called the Associated Negro Press, a news service that really was uh, 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 more than 100 weeklies catering to an African-American audience. And she held that position for 14 years. She famously said that race and sex were strikes against her, and she wasn't sure which was the hardest to break down. And as I look back at my own career, I see that there were obstacles before me as a woman, obstacles before me as a person of color, and I've never been quite sure which one I needed to navigate when. But um, today, I am uh, the editor-in-chief of CQ and Roll Call, two uh, publications uh, with a long history here in Washington that I'll talk about in a second. I am the first woman of color to uh, uh, rise to this position. And um, these uh, publications are what uh, I would call specialized or niche media. And it's an opportunity for you all to think about the media landscape and knowing that government and political reporting isn't just the Washington Post or CNN. It's organizations like the New Hampshire Bulletin, State's Newsroom. It's organizations like CQ Roll Call. Ms. Dunnigan was a crafty woman, OK? And she, uh, she is one of these women that I would love, if she were alive, I'd love to sit in a room and have uh, lunch with her. To get her White House credential, she told President Truman's pre uh, press secretary, you know, the Republican Congress is admitting Negro reporters. When is the Democratic White House going to admit us? So when you go to the White House today, remember what Ms. Dunnigan did. Uh, the Truman White House invited her in June of 1948, an election year, to go on one of Truman's whistle-stop tours. Now, back then, you know, candidates would uh, go across the country on, on trains. And her boss, a man, said to her, you know, women don't go on trips like this. So she paid her own way, OK? And while she was on board the train, she broke a story because she saw as the train was going through Missoula, Montana, there were students and people lined uh, against the railroad tracks late one night. And one of them asked President Truman a question about civil rights. And his answer seemed to indicate that civil rights would be part of his platform in 1948. And because she was there, because she was present, because she fought to be there, you know, there was a picture of her and President Truman shaking hands in more than 100 weeklies the next day. She had a story that no one else had, OK? Now, um, I did not know who Alice Dunnigan was until I, um, my colleagues and I had the occasion of um, moving to a new office. And we wanted to name conference rooms in our uh, part of the newsroom after pioneering journalists. 
and uh, someone had suggested Alice Dunnigan. And I didn't know who she was. I learned about Ida Wells, right? I, uh, there are uh, pioneers in Asian American uh, history, K.W. Lee, the first um, Korean American. But uh, I didn't know Alice Dunnigan. And ever since uh, my colleague recommended that we name a conference room after her, I've been just totally enthralled by her story. Because can you imagine in the 1940s, you know, being a black female here in this city, okay? Today, there are more than 6,000 journalists here in Washington who hold a credential to cover the Congress. Um, and uh, they represent about 600 news outlets. Most of them are radio and TV news organizations. But the largest segment uh, of growth is amongst niche media, specialized media. Organizations like CQ and Roll Call, Politico, Insider, publications like Inside Washington Publishers, which uh, publish a bunch of uh, news weeklies devoted to defense, healthcare. There are organizations now just um, devoted to climate change, defense, and the whole world really revolves around specialties now. Uh, and when I talk to young people about careers in political reporting and government reporting, I, I remind them that there's this whole world out there that's open to them that goes beyond what I would call traditional uh, media. And it's a great place to start when you are young. Um, my newsroom uh, has a, a wide variety of journalists. I manage about 50 people. Um, and we cover uh, the intersection of politics, policy, the legislative process, and the people in power, the people who make things work. CQ was founded in 1945 by uh, Nelson and Henrietta P Pointer. They are the family behind what is now today the Tampa Bay Times, okay, and the Pointer Institute, okay. PolitiFact, great org. <laughs> and the Pointers launched CQ because they believed that Congress would never be a check on itself that they needed a private entity, a news organization, to shine that light on Congress. And CQ was founded in 1945 really as a way for um, uh, newspapers back home to find out what their members of Congress were doing. In 1955, a former uh, Hollywood press secretary turned uh, congressional staffer founded Roll Call, and Roll Call was about people, okay? The people who made the most important community in Sid Udane's eyes tick, and that was the community of Capitol Hill. We merged in 2009, and uh, when I, shortly after I took over as editor-in-chief, I got rid of this invisible wall between the CQ and Roll Call newsrooms, and I united the staff so that we would work together as one. Um, one of the things that I always drive the staff to do is to look for the hidden stories. When President Biden uh, released his first budget, okay, shortly after taking office, I said to a couple of reporters, hey, you know, Biden has made equity a big deal in his campaign and his administration. Let's do a comparison. How many times does the word equity show up in President Biden's budget? How many times did it show up in President Trump's budget? As you can probably imagine, the word equity never showed up in President Trump's budget. When uh, we were getting 
ready to, uh, to talk about what we would cover on Inauguration Day. I went to one of our healthcare reporters, South a who is of South Asian descent. She's very quiet. And I said to her, didn't you say to me that your mom grew up in Chennai? Isn't that where Vice President Harris's family is from? And I asked her, what does Vice President Harris's inauguration mean to you? She worked with our features editor to write a first person account of what Kamala Harris meant to her. And this is a young reporter whose specialty is healthcare, who covers you know, everything from the children's health program to Medicaid to uh, you know, the fight over abortion at the state level. But I just asked her, trust yourself and share your experience. Um, so how did I get here? Okay. I uh, grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area, and, and I, you know, I, did, I didn't really think outside the bubble. When I turned on the TV news, there was Lloyd LaQuesta, a Filipino-American man. There was Wendy Takuda, okay, a Japanese-American woman anchoring the news. So, when I went to college and then later worked in Dallas, I didn't realize that I was a minority, right? Because in the San Francisco Bay Area, there were lots of people who looked like me. And I wasn't totally prepared for when I moved to Texas with my dark skin, a slant to my eyes, and my names ending in vowels, when people just assumed I was Mexican-American. I sat once next to a prominent lawyer at a banquet, and I had been covering city government. And this lawyer, after a few minutes talking to me, said, wow, you know, you speak really good English for an Amerasian. And I'm 23, 24, OK? And my jaw fell open, and I summoned up the courage to say, well, of course I do. I was born here. I was born in San Francisco. I'm an American, OK? And that wouldn't be the first time that I was subject to what I call mistaken identity, really ignorance, OK? People not knowing. Uh, one time in the Dallas newsroom, um, this is back in the day when people would actually design the newspaper with a pencil and a sheet of paper. An editor on the copy desk and the uh, page design desk handed me the day's pages to design. And I looked at him because I had been at the paper for a couple of years. I was covering city government. I was covering local politics. And I did not really understand. And I asked him, what are these pages for? He assumed that I was the new page designer and copy editor, a Chinese American woman, 10, 15 years older than me, who we look nothing alike, but he just assumed that we were the same person. Later, that person and I would become the best of friends, and we both had the honor at different times of uh, leading the Asian American Journalists Association, a group that has been there for me since my days as a student at Southern Cal. Anybody USC? Nah. Because I was going to say, if there was a USC student in this room, you, you, got, you get lunch out of me. OK? But there you go. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. You forgot. There you go. But groups like AAJA, NABJ, NAHJ, NAJA, the National Press Foundation were here 
to bring a new generation of journalists to, sh to help you find your power and to find your voice. The definition of what is a journalist today and who can be a journalist and what is journalism is very, very different from when I started out. It used to be that you would just think about working for a newspaper or you know, a TV network, but now thanks to technology, okay, anybody can be a journalist. But what sets you apart, okay, from just a content creator is the truth. You need to find the truth, verify your facts, and have the integrity to gather that news and to stand by it, all right? Um, I'm kind of moving around here. So when Rachel asked me to speak, I thought, you know, what do I have to share and what, you know, what, what kind of wisdom can I impart? Now, um, I am on the board of uh, the National Press Foundation. You, I think, heard yesterday from Sudeep Reddy, uh, another board member, and you'll be hearing later on from uh, Ter uh, Terrence Samuel, another board member. And uh, uh, Terry and I used to cover the Hill roughly the same time. Okay, and you used to be able to count, you know, maybe on two hands, how many people of color there were covering the Capitol or covering the White House. That thankfully has changed. But I've, uh, again, mistaken identity, people not knowing. I remember standing in um, <clears throat> the entryway of the speaker's lobby waiting during a vote to talk to a lawmaker and a young page, you know, the high school students who uh, ferry messages about, came up to me and handed me a message, okay? And I realized it was for Hawaii Congresswoman Patsy Mink, okay? Japanese American who at the time was maybe, I don't know, 20 or 30 years older than me. And I thought to myself, okay, should I give the young man credit that at least I was mistaken for another Asian American? Okay. And again, you know, I was polite and I said, I introduced myself, I said, hi, I'm Catalina Camilla and I forget where I was working at the time. And the young man was very apologetic and basically said to me, you know, I've never seen a journalist of color, okay? And this was not that long ago, maybe 20 years ago or something. Um, so a couple of strategies for success, and I realize I'm bouncing around because Rachel and I wanted to have a conversation, get a dialogue going, then I wanted to hear from you all. Um, one is become experts, okay? I've covered government a long time, and my work speaks for itself because I come to the job with experience. Um, try to immerse yourself in a topic, get to know something, um, and bring others along, okay, as you develop your expertise. Something that you've heard before uh, in the last couple of day, uh, days is develop allies. Now you've got, like I said, a room full of allies here. But uh, whether it's your counterparts, people who are just coming up, people who are above you, you know, um, your networks, both vertical and horizontal, are very important to you. I mentioned this earlier, have integrity. Check your facts, be thorough, don't cut corners, okay? No matter what platform you decide to specialize in, you've got to write, write some more, and write even more after that. Whether you're the audience engagement manager at a network, a sports reporter, okay, for a newspaper, or a blogger, 
you've got to hone your writing skills. As a manager, one of the things that I've learned over time is I try to treat people the same way I want to be treated, with respect, with candor, with um, empathy and understanding. The last two years managing a newsroom in the midst of the pandemic has been, I don't even know where to begin. It's been a trying experience. Um, on March 12th, 2020, the last day we were in the office, I, uh, I remember saying to some folks, you know, bring your notebooks, bring your notes. And people were saying, oh, you know, we'll be back in a couple of weeks. Well, a couple of weeks became a couple of months. And I adopted this mantra that the health and safety of the staff came first. And I was OK if we were going to miss stories, because I wanted people to be healthy and safe. I talk to people all the time. I, um, uh, I am the kind of boss who knows the name of your dog, name of your significant other, where you're from, because your peop my staff, they're people to me. They're not just folks who we share a business, we share a common goal, but they're people. And so the last two years have been incredibly hard. Um, we've literally, in our newsroom, been through life and death together. I became editor-in-chief after my predecessor uh, died in 2018. Uh, he had been diagnosed with brain cancer, and he had taken a hard fall that cost him his life. Since I've been editor-in-chief, in addition to the pandemic, I've helped colleagues who have brought life into the world, new babies, OK? But I've also helped colleagues who, unfortunately, have lost a spouse or a child as well. And so you learn that you know the headlines are great, the bylines are great, the awards are great, but what matters is you as people. Um, and so that's why leading with empathy is just so important. Uh, also, as a boss, I try very hard to step back so others around me can succeed. I'm asked to speak a lot, OK? And every now and then, I'll say no, but here's somebody else. Um, there were, uh, there's a colleague of mine, an Asian American uh, editor, who made a seamless transition from reporter to editor. And she, um, she was having trouble finding her voice. And so I kind of nudged her a little bit. Hey, you know, I'm busy, and I really wasn't. I'm busy. Can you step in for me at this event and speak? Oh, sure. And she was a huge hit, OK? When uh, uh, folks ask me to participate in meetings, I say, you know, do you really need me, or do you really need Rachel, who's on the front lines? And I'll promote Rachel. I step back so others can uh, have the spotlight. It's something called imprinting. I am imprinting for you with others so that they know who you are. Two very important things as a female leader of color uh, that I've learned to do. One is I don't apologize. And no disrespect to the men in this room, but men, when they're in charge, they don't apologize. So when I say, like I'm in a scrum and I want to talk to a lawmaker, I don't say, I'm sorry, do you have a minute? Can I ask you a question? I'll say, Acacia, may I have a minute? Can I ask you about this bill on the floor? I don't apologize. Women, in particular, men, young men, 
don't apologize when you're speaking for yourself and asking for a new assignment, recognition, more responsibility. Raise your hand, because people like me, we're not mind readers. Alexi, if you want to someday cover economics for the New York Times, or if you want to write a financial blog, you need to let me, your boss, know that. And I'll find a time, I hope, where I can get you on that path. I've done that a couple of times where I've gone back to reporters and said, hey, you know, the first time, Deepa, you talked to me and you said you wanted to cover the State Department. Well, this person's out today. Do you think you can go to the State Department news conference? I tried to do that, OK? And then the last, probably, uh, most important thing, and I have trouble uh, uh, living up to my own uh, admonition, but um, as a female in a leadership position and a person of color in a leadership position, I've learned to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Okay? And by that, I know that leadership is not about winning friends. Being the boss, being editor-in-chief and vice president of CQ Roll Call is not about winning friends. I have 52 people I'm responsible for. I am their advocate. But I also sometimes have to mete out discipline. I have to say no. I have to tell people that I respond to no. And it's uncomfortable, right? Um, one of the things that I've overcome over time is I'm not a very tall person, as you can see, OK? And whether I'm running around in crowds up, on the up, up in the Capitol or I'm in a room of mostly men, you know, I, I stand tall. I project, OK? And sometimes they don't know that I'm shaking inside because I'm uncomfortable about it. But I know that people are counting on me. So I learned that my leadership is not because I hold a title, OK? You all will be leaders regardless of whether your title is reporter, researcher, or editor-in-chief. Leadership is not the title that you have. It's the way you project, the way you carry yourself, the way you ask for and demand respect and give respect. And that's where I think we should stop. Well, I think I have a couple of urgent burning questions. Let's, let's uh, right. Sonny has questions, too. And, and what we're going to do is uh, open it up to questions for the group. But I, I just, I could not help sort of uh, asking about more information about that moment when the kid handed you the note and it was for someone else and you had to make a decision, well, you know, don't take it personally, whatever. I want to talk about this issue of managing expectations, of constantly having to assess and weigh, was this a slight, was it not? Talk about how you handle it after. OK, uh, I have handled it well and not well, probably more not well than well. OK, I've learned the hard way that you that you should assume positive intent. But my, my colleagues will tell you I am the first person in your face when <laughs> you st step over the line that I perceive is there. OK. Now, this was a 16-year-old, 17-year-old. And it wasn't going to, you know, he wasn't going to learn if I jumped down his throat. OK. Now, I, I can tell, unfortunately, I have lots of stories about this. Let me tell you another one. A prominent civil rights leader once just assumed that I was Hispanic. Okay? And I, I thought about it. I was uncomfortable about it. I said something to my editor. And my editor said something to the editor in chief. And the editor-in-chief called that civil rights leader 
and advocated on my behalf, which I did not expect, okay? And that civil rights leader, next time he was in Dallas and I happened to be at the news conference, took me aside and said, I'm sorry, and we had a conversation. I look for opportunities to have dialogue with people who slight me. I don't, I, and I need to do it more often. You know, I can even top you, Kat. <laughs> so when I was I'm at the sure Miss Rachel can top. Okay. <laughs> at the uh, Clearwater Times, and I was a feature writer, and I loved telling stories. And one of the stories I did was about a quinceanera, mm -hmm. and. I went and spent time with the family and did a wonderful long feature and they, people loved it. And one of my colleagues said, you're such a great writer. You're such an articulate person. Then the, the next one. Yeah. You know, I don't even really think of you as black. Ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Really? As if that was a compliment to me. Mm -hmm. And so I guess what you're providing me insight in is and I said this the other day, how do we leverage opportunities to either educate, set straight, rebuke? How do we weigh when to do it and how to do it? And it, it, There's no rhyme or reason, right? Okay, I, I have been called out in my career uh, uh, by whites, blacks, Hispanics, fellow Asians, and for me, it's a question of, am I in the place to learn, to listen, to understand? Um, I, I, I was president of a coalition that no longer exists called Unity Journalists of Color. And it was a time when uh, the black, Hispanic, Asian American, and Native American journalists thought that by working together, we can, you know. Uh, show of strength. Show of strength and uh, help people understand that our, we had more common challenges than differences. Unfortunately, the coalition disbanded a few years ago uh, over a variety of disputes, but that those two years as unity president really taught me to um, take a pause, to listen. A, the, for Asian Americans in particular, you know, our diaspora is so wide, okay? I, I once uh, had a young black female reporter come to me and ask me how I celebrated Chinese New Year, okay? And I said to her, I don't, I'm Filipino, uh, I'm Asian American, and I said to her, we're all different, okay? We may have common co commonalities. Like, uh, I read this wonderful book once about rice, okay? And how rice was a common element in many different cultures, okay? But even just reading the chapters about how rice was perceived differently among Asian American groups, it was just kind of fascinating to me. But, I, I mean, yes, you were both of the age where we listen for the code words. My, you know, Rachel, you're so articulate. Really, why would you expect me not to be? <laughs> well, I, you, know, you know, since you mentioned unity, I'll offer another insight that's important for you uh, fellows to have, and that is at Unity 94, uh, Knight Ritter arranged a, a dinner for the promising stars of Knight Ritter, and we were in Atlanta. And so I'm at this dinner, and I sit down next to, or Rich Apple sits down next to me. Uh -huh. And you know how the managers in these settings are just sort of not really looking at anybody in specific, yeah. it's just, so we're so happy to have you all here, and blah, blah, blah. He can't wait to get to his martini after the dinner. <laughs> so. Uh, as we're getting ready to order dinner, I reached for the wine list and I opened it up and I said, oh, th this Chilean red, I just bought a bottle of that. I, I, I really love Chilean red wines. Rich's head snapped around like, oh, a 
black woman knows about Chilean red wine? I mean, and I'm not saying that yeah. in a negative way because you'll hear the end of the story. But it was as if all of a sudden he saw me as more than just the, the, the masses, the, right. but as a person. And so we began to talk and we had a conversation and we had a dialogue all through the dinner. And this dinner was on a Thursday night. Monday morning, Rich Apple called me at my desk at the Detroit Free Press and said, I want you to come work in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. And so when we, we encounter these kinds of, of situations, as I was saying earlier, there can be an opportunity to, to just destroy expectations and yeah. stereotypes. And so rather than my response to him being, well, what, what, don't you think black women like red wine or whatever, it was an opportunity for me to engage and to expand and broaden a perception. Yeah, I, I, look, I can count way too many times that I jumped down somebody's throat and I, I was always apologetic about it because again, that's not how I would want to be approached, right? And so you learn the hard way and you have to always remind yourself, how do you want to be treated? But it's not how, also not how you're perceived in terms right. of your demeanor. You're expected to be passive, it, quiet. Yes, the Asian American female st stereotype. I'm expected to be quiet. Okay, my in my indoor voice is louder than most people's. Okay, <laughs> I'm expected to be quiet, demure, in the background. Me. Okay, now Mina, I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> In your family history, who's the strongest person in the family? It's the mom, right? And grandma, yeah, okay. In my family, we didn't cross grandma, right? Okay? So that perception about Asian American women is totally, it's, you can turn it on its head, right? Um, to this day, my cousins and I, you know, our grandma's long past, but we still do things grandma's way. Because she's watching us. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say a special thank you to Kat, who beat me to the punch. Um, but in addition to everything else you've heard that Kat has done, accomplished, and how much she's given back, um, this program wouldn't be happening without Kat or Sadiq. Um, Kat was one of the first initiators. Um, she's been involved with the Maynard Foundation. She has given to every journalism uh, group known to man. She mentioned working with um, Sadiq, but what I don't think she mentioned was that she and, uh, and Sadiq had, have been instrumental in starting many programs um, of journalists, for journalists of color. She's embodied the advice that Sadiq gave you yesterday about giving back. Um, so, and thank you, Kat, thank you. for your support of me and NPF, and this wouldn't be happening without you. So please give it up for Kat. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so let's open it up for questions. Are there any questions? Yeah, my name is uh, Brian Lopez. I'm with the Texas Tribune. Um, as an uh, early career reporter, um, how do you suggest that um, we can support other maybe upcoming journalists of color? And uh, do you ever think there's a right time to make a transition into a managing role to do that? Uh, okay, uh, a couple things. Um, your first question was about political reporting. Is that right? Did I hear how, you right? How can you uh, support, I guess, uh, journalists of color that are right. coming like behind you or that oh, are your colleagues? Okay. I, I am. A, a, I came up. What was what used to be called the traditional way, right? I started out in local news, and then I went to a major regional newspaper, and then I came to Washington. I came to Washington in 1993, okay, before many of you were born, before all of you were born. And um, the editor who recruited me um, said, come to, come to Congressional Quarterly and learn to cover Congress the right way. And it was like going to graduate school, OK? You would learn about the federal budget. You would learn about the appropriations process. I, the only beat open was uh, the environment, OK? And I said, you know, 
I don't recycle. I don't, I don't, I'm not green, okay? I don't know if I, clean water, safe water, you know, I, clean air, it, they were all foreign concepts to me. You are on the record. Yes, I know, I know. I recycle now, okay? Because I recycle and I compost now because it's a requirement in Arlington County where I live, but this was 30 years ago. Okay, so I, I, I'm, I'm a believer in building blocks, okay? And the way I did it is not the way that you all may choose to do it. But I always let my work speak for itself. And I always raise my hand. Hey, you know, um, uh, do you need extra help this weekend for this rally? Or, oh, uh, this editor is taking some time off. Do you think I might learn how to be an editor? Okay. Um, and so, <clears throat> like I said earlier, uh, particularly now in the position that I have, I, I try to get to know all the people who work at CQ Roll Call, but you got to raise your hand. You got and uh, I had this situation just a couple weeks ago where two reporters applied for an opening that they weren't yet ready for, okay? And I took them aside individually and I said, okay, I'm glad you put your hat in, but let's talk about what you're doing now and where I'd like to see you go so that the next time this job is open, I'm gonna say, hey, Brian, this job's yours, right? And just the 20, 30 minutes I spent with them trying to give them tips on how to parlay what they're doing now to get noticed, uh, I hope was helpful to them. Um, and that's, that's all I can say, really. Also, there is no, okay, the, your generation and the generation before you, your, you all are blessed with energy, desire, and ambition like nobody's business, okay? And that's great, okay? That's great because you're, I don't see any of you in this room settling, okay? And we as people of color, and we as journalists should never settle, okay? Push yourself harder. And sometimes you need to push yourself harder than people will push yourself. Okay, Let me Crystal, my... you are next. And then uh, Amanda will go to you next. Crystal. Oh, Crystal, I'm sorry. Hi, um, so I work for Lansing State Journal and I'm very assertive in my newsroom because I just see opportunities and I assert in. And for me, I like to be that leader, but a leader as a reporter. Mm -hmm. So like, what's your advice to others who want to be a leader as a career reporter and not a leader who wants to go on and to be in an editor role? You know, um, uh, a couple, three things, uh, Crystal, one is, to uh, network and work with other reporters who, who are just like you, want to be better reporters, OK? How can we, working together, get to where we want to go? And if it means that you and other reporters, whether it's reporters with 20 years of experience or two years experience, go to your editors and say, you know, we need more training, and here's where we can get it. Or we want to start writing about, you know, um, changing conditions, changing demographics in uh, the state house in Lansing. Again, finding your allies. Uh, the other thing is to look for uh, look for the opportunities that help you but also the news organization, okay? Uh, it's where your needs meet business needs, right? Let's say there's 
um, uh, you go to a community forum and you hear from readers of the Lansing State Journal that something is not being covered at the State House. And maybe that interests you. So you go to your um, editors and say, you know, I heard at this community forum that readers want more information about how their lawmakers voted. What if I tried to do X? And then go back to the, to the reader who suggested that and say, how did this work for you? Could you help me by letting my boss know, hey, this is the kind of article coverage that we want, might want to see. And you're absolutely right, Crystal. Not every reporter wants to take an editing path. I, I have, I, up until about 10 years ago, I went back and forth, OK? And um, again, because of the unfortunate circumstances of my predecessor dying, I was kind of thrust into this position I was a senior editor working with reporters who covered the Supreme Court and um, influence and power, lobbying, campaign finance, and whatnot. And I was happy as a clam. But um, I, and I had uh, kind of senior editing positions uh, in previous jobs where I burnt out after a couple of years. And I thought, oh, do I want to do this again? And then the next thing I know, it's four years later, and uh, uh, I'm still doing it. There are moments that are incredibly rewarding. But for me, the most rewarding moment is when I see you or someone on the staff reach their potential or do what they want to do. And it doesn't have to be my way. Who's next? I have two questions for you. Um, the first is picking up on a couple threads you've already mentioned where you left off with Brian's question about um, having that internal drive and really pushing yourself to do the work that you can do. I know I personally have a little bit of a complicated relationship with ambition. Um, and you also mentioned, you know, sort of the flip side of that or the dark face of it with burnout. So I'm wondering how you have found a workable balance for yourself. Okay. Uh I've not, and, <laughs> and I'm going to be working on it for a long time, OK? Um, I, it, I'm really looking, I, OK, let me back up for a second. About ambition, OK? You can take big steps if, that's, if that works for you. You can take tiny steps, but take the time to look back and look at your own growth. I always say to new reporters who are coming into CQ and roll call, because of our subscription business and because of the unique things that we do in terms of public policy reporting, I always say to them, you know, your first three months, you're going to learn how we work. You're going to learn the beat. Your next three months, probably won't look the same. A year after that, it definitely shouldn't look the same, because you'll learn, grow, figure out what works, what doesn't. That's the same thing with ambition, OK? Maybe uh, I, I, every day I write out a to-do list. They're my goals, right? And every day, there are some things that I don't cross off. But it's OK. I come back at it again the next day. Um, and you'll find that maybe there are times when you're in the fast lane, maybe there are times that you're in the slow lane. But I encourage you, always take a step back and look. And for all of you in particular, compliment yourself. Know when to say, you know what, I did that. And I'm proud of it, OK? Um, uh, balance. Well, balance is an interesting thing. Um, and, and I'll be honest, the pandemic has, for many people, myself included, really taught us about what's important in work and life. And like you know, the story I told you all, 
where I caught myself saying to the reporters and to the editors, hey, it's OK if we miss a story, right? I'd rather you be healthy. I'd rather you be safe. I did an incredibly, um, uh, I, I did something at the beginning of the pandemic that I never thought I would do, where I asked the staff, who feels comfortable working up on the hill? And we set up an internal pool situation where we rotated reporters off and on the hill working for others, okay? And we calibrated that pool off and on for like a year, year and a half. And there was this incredible thing that happened at the beginning of the pandemic where many major news organizations were working with each other as a pool. So, no one got themselves in a situation that was unsafe. I mean, at the beginning of the pandemic, okay, you have to remember, there were lawmakers in their 80s up on the Capitol not wearing masks, okay? Mm -hmm. And I would tell reporters, nope, you do not have to run into that crowd. You, if, you can get another senator's quote, okay? You don't necessarily need that senator who's going to you know, this is pre-vaccination, okay? I said, no, no. And someone said to me, D do you realize what you sound like when you say that? And I said, well, hopefully I sound sane. <laughs> uh, uh, I, you know, that, that's the first thing that should come to mind. I don't think I really answered your question, but I had we'll one, talk more. I had one other one, if that's, if that's okay. Sure, yeah, and, then, uh, this and then this young gonna man... Go Oh. Okay. Okay. Right. Yeah, we'll go back and forth. Okay. <laughs> and I apologize. I'm only looking at my watch because I have no concept of what time it is. So, because I can talk all day. Unfortunately, go for it, you talked a little bit about how, when with the two reporters who applied for a job they weren't ready with, you had that conversation with them. I'm wondering what your advice would be if you're somebody who doesn't have that editor to pull you aside and say, Here, here's how you bridge that gap, what, would you, what advice oh, would you give? That's a good question. Um, I, I've had situations where um, reporters and editors, junior editors, have said to me that they mentioned to their bosses that they wanted to try something new or different and it didn't get back to me or didn't get to the right person who could uh, make a difference. And um, uh, my advice and counsel is this, is get to know the person who can make a difference for you. Get to know the decision maker. And if you know that the decision maker is, let's just say me, and I'm, I talk to Ann every day, because she's my deputy, then maybe your strategy is to talk to Ann to get my attention, right? That's, that's how widening your network and working horizontally and vertically works. Um, uh, and you'll find that, I hope you will find as you progress in your careers that more people are open to listening and to giving advice. Um, because I've heard many people say to me, do you remember when you were in my position? And I'll say yes, and that makes me wake up and think, okay, how can I be the best advocate for you? on this side of the room. I'm going to stand up if you all don't mind, because now I need to, I, I, you know, I got to tell you. Um, I, I just hope that we all get back into in-person work soon, because I spend way too much time talking to a computer screen sitting down. So uh, yes, Hi, Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, so I hoping you can share some advice on how we can hold managers accountable from you know the positions that we're in now as um, you know uh, reporters um, 
particularly when it comes to issues of commitment and of, of uh, diversity and representation. I mean, our company, for example, um, has expressed that you know they want to reach parity by 2025, but you know hiring is only part of the issue. After that, it's you know the retention and you know there's been a lot of kind of issues. I feel not just in our company, but probably all across the industry of um, you know the the, the support and um, you know addressing that. And I think it kind of feels like you know there's also like a sense of responsibility. You know, once you're inside, to also help out and you know for the people that are coming after you. And so I'm hoping if you can share some advice on on you know how to how to do that. Okay, uh, recruiting and retention are two of the hardest things for any newsroom manager to face. I, I um, we've got some open positions now that are proving to be more difficult than I thought it would be to recruit for in large part because of the ex, um, because of the needs of our subscribers okay and um, and I've said to some folks in the newsroom and to our recruiters you know we have to grow our own okay and I wanted for a while to do exactly this to widen the pipeline by you know, my colleagues and I going out to um, colleges or other newsrooms to say, okay, this is what we do, this is how you can get there. I have, and I can only do so much one-on-one, -on -one, right? But the accountability on um, diversity and equity in your newsroom goes beyond just the actual numbers of who you hire. It really starts with, are you taking the steps to build that pipeline? What are you doing to put the news organization out there? And one of the things that will help the Arizona Republic and any newspaper is, are you covering the community that exists around you? Are they being reflected accurately on your pages, on your websites, in your photos. Um, because that's where it starts. Arizona is an incredibly diverse state. But it's more than just a discussion about Latinos, Native Americans, African Americans. There are pockets of the state where there are lots of Asians. There as we've all seen from the census data, lots of communities across the country that are mixed race, that have gendered, uh, that have generational differences. If you attack it, if you attack the problem both in terms of coverage, then the recruiting and retention will be helped. If you attack the problem of recruiting and retention, the coverage hopefully will get better too. And that's where you and your colleagues should hold yourselves and your leadership accountable. Just to follow up on that, what if you know, at some point you determine that the, the, the coverage is not representative? Um, like, you know, what are you know, helpful next steps that you, feel, you know, could be taken to then address that? Um, I, okay, I find that, um, being out in the community, I, yeah, uh, listening, being aware of trends. Uh, many news organizations have lots of analytics, okay? I encourage, we don't have as many analytics as I like, but I encourage leaders to share analytics down to the reporter photographer level because it helps you to understand okay this story worked really well but this one didn't why okay or these are the stories that made subscribers re-up their subscription why but these stories didn't that's the kind of feedback that I think helps in a 360 degree way can you talk about a time where like maybe there has been a rupture in distrust between managers and reporters and and was there a way to like 
rebuild that? Because I think about how many newsrooms have had this like internal conversation, and pe and you know people are hurt, but yeah. like we can't just stay there forever, right? Like how do we yeah. move forward on with that? Um, There have been a couple of times in my career. One time in Dallas, I forget what the what the situation was, but we were having a staff meeting where an African American female reporter and a white male reporter disagreed about some coverage area. Okay, and it was a little shocking because you know voices were raised and. It probably wasn't the most comfortable conversation, but over time, it helped folks understand the importance of talking and learning. Okay, One of the things that happened in my own newsroom after um, uh, George Floyd was killed was I asked uh, I asked the newsroom to uh, break up into three or four different task, for, task forces to talk about language, okay? To talk about ethics and our place in society versus our. Um, our traditions and norms as journalists. Uh, a group talked about recruiting and retention. Um, and these were good conversations. They were difficult conversations. We, the um, group that dealt with words and language, immediately we adopted some changes to um, the style book, which were long overdue. Um, the group that uh, discussed ethics and uh, participation in public life, they had a full and robust discussion. And in the end, they made the recommendation of, hey, you know, no, we need to be, we need to uphold who we are as an organization, nonpartisan, independent, so no, we're not going to advocate that reporters march in the streets, but we had the conversation, we talked about ways that we could still be true to who we are as people. Um, uh, one of the things that came out of that was uh, some social media guidelines that needed to be tightened up. Um, it, so it was, and we still have a long way to go. Um, it wasn't perfect, but it was, I think, helpful. Moderators, privilege here. OK. Um, I want to ask you about January 6th. Oh. Yes. <laughs> OK, all right. <laughs> no, um, just give us your top notes about being a woman of color leading a, a media organization on January 6th. On January 6th, um, you know, there were five CQ roll call journalists at the Capitol. Uh, three photographers, is that right? Three photographers, two reporters. Um, I encourage all of you to go in, on the roll call website. Uh, uh, Two of the photographers and uh, one of the reporters shared one year later their recollection, okay, uh, in, in both um, in print and in a podcast, okay? Um, and it's the political theater podcast that you're looking for. Uh, I, uh, I did not fathom the depth of that day until several days later 
when I could not help but see more images, uh, the videos and whatnot. There is a photo taken by a photo, a CQ Roll Call photojournalist Tom Williams that I'm pretty sure you all in this room have seen. And it is the photo of the Congresswoman hyperventilating in the House chamber being aided by two male congressmen. Tom got right, and I mean right in her face, okay? Because for Tom, this, it was the story. And if you listen to his, to his words in the podcast, he says, okay, maybe I didn't assess the situation properly, okay? But he remembered what it was like on 9-11, fleeing the Capitol and not getting the shot. And he put his journalism first. He wanted the shot. He wanted the story, okay? I, uh, on January 6th, okay, I'm in a meeting and I had C-SPAN on and I could see that the Capitol was breached because there were people walking by the C-SPAN camera who did not look like members of Congress or press and they were heading toward the chamber, okay? And I'm thinking, where are they? Where, where is the CQ roll call staff? One photographer was outside. Two photographers were inside. One was in the house chamber. The other, a woman we later learned, was right around the corner from where the Senate chamber was uh, breached. Okay, that picture of um, the Capitol Police officer who, uh, you know, steered the crowd the other way, she was around the other corner. Okay. We didn't know that until much later. And I, again, I did not appreciate just how scary and incomprehensible it was. And I woke up, okay, by Sunday morning saying, you know what? Not the, the staff needs help, and it's not just the five who are there, but for those who fee, feel as though they should have been there, because this was still at a time when we were keeping a lot of reporters off the hill, okay? And uh, another editor and I, we called the DART Center for Trauma and Journalism in New York. And, you know, their phones were ringing off the hook. And we said, we need help. We need to reach out to the staff, not just those who were there, but for the last two years who have been working nonstop, they have been traumatized by covering COVID, OK? They have been traumatized by working in this environment. The staff also, particularly here in Washington, if you've been covering politics and government since 2016, you know, it gets a little tiresome to hear that you are the enemy of the people. And I did not fully understand or comprehend all of that trauma until we let it all out in a great session that um, the DART Center moderated for us. And we've brought the DART Center in one or two times since then. Once to talk to managers on how to manage in this environment. Again, uh, a check-in with the whole staff. And um, uh, uh, I know that the DART Center has done this for lots of news organizations since January 6th. In emotional resiliency, this is a good way to end this. Emotional resiliency is the skill that they do not teach you in journalism school, okay? But it is the essential skill to survive in journalism today. To know, to, to be able to withstand not just the internal pressures of doing well as a journalist, but the external pressures as well. Um, 
And I, I, I encourage you all, OK, to go on the DART Center's website because they have these really helpful guides of tips on how to handle stress and trauma. Um, and the most important thing is it's OK to admit that you're dealing with stress and that you're dealing with trauma and to seek help. Ladies and gentlemen, you have just received a master class <laughs> on the impact of a woman's leadership. Thank you. I have been in this business for almost 40 years now, and I've heard this woman's name throughout most of that time. And so coming to work for MPS was my first opportunity to meet her. And it has been such a privilege. I hope you all are as, as, as been nurtured by her comments as I have. So thank you so much. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you all. Uh, I uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I hope you all have a good time at the White House. And as you go uh, into the press room and um, take a tour, just remember Alice Dunnigan. She was there. Her with us. She was there for us. Do you have any Thank you. Advice for us in the White House? Um, okay. Well, let's see. Um, uh, you know, I don't know who. I, it, there's some permanent press workspace, so I don't know who's been working permanently. Our reporter goes in when uh, he rotates and shares a desk, actually. But um, uh, talk to folks. Uh, Gabrielle, if April Ryan is there, you need to seek out Miss April Ryan, OK? Because April Ryan. <laughs> she, she, she knows. She, she knows where it's at. Um, but uh, are, are you all meeting with anybody from the press? Staff? Well, we were told Corrine Jean Pierre, but apparently okay. she's busy, okay. so we don't know who will be speaking with us. So. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's okay. First of all, just a little word to the wise: that press, that press room. It's smaller than it looks on the TV. I'll just say that to you. It's much smaller, OK? Um, but uh, if they let you, go behind the podium, take the picture. Oh, yeah. Got to oh, yeah. do it. Got to do it. All right, thank you all very thank much. Thank you so much. Bye.